IRA booby trap explodes shortly after a woman soldier is shot. One policeman has been killed in the markets area of Belfast. They took me out of the car and, and he took out this gun and he, and he put it to my head. The gunmen started firing. There was nothing I could have done. Camera crews were forced to stop filming. When religion is done well, it feeds the poor, it builds bridges, it breaks down walls of isolation. When it's done badly, it can become fuel for horrendous war and genocide. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs said, religion is like fire and like fire it warms, but it also burns. And we are the guardians of the flame. I'm Johnny Clark. I moved to Northern Ireland as a nine-year-old from New Zealand. I was a bit of an outsider. I saw a country in a cycle of daily violence, and I remember thinking to myself, there will never be an end to this. Later, I spent eight years living and working in the epicenter of our conflict. We even had a house that straddled one of Belfast's peace walls with the Catholic Springfield Road running adjacent to the Protestant Shankill. We literally and metaphorically became a bridge for people to get from one side to the other. But how did this conflict happen? Well, in conflict areas, historical narratives are always disputed and history is often told by the winner. But in a nutshell, Britain has been a presence in Ireland for over 800 years. Ironically, 400 years ago, the one part of the country that was not under British rule was the northern part. Rather than just sending an occupying army, they sent a plantation of people backed by British military might. Over the next century, thousands of Scottish and English settlers moved into Ulster, mainly Protestant Presbyterians or Anglicans who held the ascendancy. In 1921, Ireland was partitioned for the first time. The northernmost Protestant and British six counties remained part of the UK, and the political state of Northern Ireland was created. This new state had an inbuilt majority of Protestants, which are referred to as Unionists or Loyalists. The minority population were Catholics, referred to as nationalists or republicans. In 1969, the time bomb of two tribes sharing one piece of land exploded into a 29-year period of incessant sectarian violence known as the Troubles. This was ended with the signing of our peace agreement, but it came at the cost of thousands of lost lives. I always looked underneath the car because we'd been told we should be looking for anything unusual. There's not a single calendar day in Northern Ireland when nobody died in troubles. Every day is somebody down a worship. I've spent my life working in the religious sphere. You could say I'm a professional Christian. Yet one of the dominant themes in our conflict has been the religious background of the two tribes. Religion posed problems. There was a history of that going way back to the, to the start of the state. I think people trying to right the wrongs that they felt had been done in the past. So it wasn't just that we were apart in terms of our religion, but also you know, people in, in, in society were saying that we're, we're also apart racially. You know, we look different, or we think different, we are different. And when you start to think like that, uh, you start to demonize the other people who are not like you. Just as our house in Belfast became a bridge, I'm looking to discover people who have suffered immensely during our conflict, but have chosen to build bridges instead of walls of resentment. I'm on a journey to discover those who, to paraphrase the words of our poet Seamus Heaney, can let justice rise up, hope and history rhyme, and who hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Then a gunman came up this road here, Johnny, and they were made up of a mixture of the RUC, which was the, was the police force, the UDR, which was the reserve police force, and members of the British Army. And they stopped their, their car down there and they walked across the, the field. There was a hedge here and they just jumped over that uh, hedge and, uh, and they came in. Just a flash, just a go past here again. Uh, Eugene Reavy is my name. I'm from I'm from the south of Northern Ireland, just on the on the border with Southern Ireland almost. And uh, it's a, it's a little village called uh, White Cross in South Armagh. There was eight boys in our house and four girls and my mother and father. That was 
there was 14. So if you weren't fit to look after yourself at the dinner table, you would starve. <laughs> it was just after Christmas. It was the, Sunday was the 3rd of January, and there was three boys left in the house, and they were sitting watching Celebrity Squares about five past six. And the door sort of opened slightly, and there was this, and there was the, a bar of a gun appeared at the top of the door. But before they could get, they could get doing it, a gunfire opened this, but I started to shoot. And uh, 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 John Martin, who was sitting at the fireside, there was three bullets hit him here, and uh, and he fell onto the floor, and. Uh, Brian was shot through the heart. One bullet went right through his, his back and through his heart. And I think he, he, he had a few other bullets at the, in his lower back. Anthony ran up into the room and dived onto the bed. And the uh, gunman followed him up and got up on the bed and he, and he riddled the bed with bullets. When Anthony heard them going away, he ventured out from under the bed. And Brian, he was, he was sitting in the fireplace dead and he felt his pulse. And uh, you know, he made his way up into the kitchen and John Martin, he was lying on the floor and he was, he was really cutting two with these bullets. I found out uh, about a month ago or so that, that in the first shooting, there was only three bullets hit him in the front. And when he fell on the floor, a young man put another 40 bullets into him. You know, and uh, I haven't really got over that since uh, since I heard that. I wish I hadn't heard that, because if you're shooting a dog, like you'd only shoot him once. On the fourth of January, 1976, Eugene Reeve's three brothers were shot. Two of the brothers, Brian and John Martin, died instantly, while Anthony survived and was able to leave hospital, but was found unconscious three weeks later. He had a brain hemorrhage. I couldn't do anything with them, so on the Thursday morning, they, then I switched off the uh, 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 the life support machine. The undertakers put the lids on the coffins, uh, and we carried them out into the in, uh, into the hearses. And somewhere along the road, we were stopped by the soldiers. They knew by the two horses in front that it was us coming home with our deceased brothers. And this young soldier, he had a, uh, he had a rifle in my back and he was shaking like a leaf. So he was, and the gun was going like that there. And, and the, and the, uh, he was, uh, and the, uh, they, like there's a lot of detail around this that I don't want to go into, so I'm just going to say that they started to abuse my mother, and uh, they were calling her all sorts of names. And he said, "Oh, Mrs. Reavy," he says, uh, uh, "You've only one nose, Mrs. Reavy. I mean, where's your other nose?" And he was, he was, he was uh, manhandling her, and then it got worse. It got, it, de it degenerated. And I, th and I thought to myself, my God, Mommy has reared us fellas all up, and in our time of need, we, we can't even defend her, because uh, the guy that had the gun in my back, he would have shot me just as quick as he would have. And it's, it's to my regret to this day that I didn't bust that, that fella that was at that, that was, a, that was making a mockery of my mother. I mean, it haunts me to this day. I should have... Oh, it doesn't matter. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Just I guess that's like a water. Sorry, lads.
Well, hello, Thank Johnny. You. How Great are you? you? Great to see you. Yeah. Come on on in. Okay. I probably didn't know your story really much. I didn't know many people that had suffered in that way, you know, and it was like, it was like a different world, you know. Uh, I suppose yeah. we thought that everything happening was either in the Shankill or West Belfast. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in actual fact, there was quite a lot of stuff that yeah, happened yeah. in and around the yeah. Belmont area. I'm Beryl Quigley, and I was born and brought up in Belfast. When I met Bill McConnell, uh, who became my husband, he was an assistant governor in the prison service here in Northern Ireland. We had a few years of, of uh, a courtship, and then we got married in the spring of 1979. At different times during our marriage, danger seemed to be closer to our home than perhaps it might have been before that. And there were times when Bill would have come home from work and said to me, just be careful. On Tuesday, the 6th of March, 1984, a normal day, Bill was planning to go into work in the Mays prison, as he did each day. We kissed, we hugged, we said our goodbyes. When out of the side of my eye, I noticed movement and turned to look in the direction of our neighbor's home. And there were two young men. I noticed that they had guns and I shouted at Bill. He turned, saw them and turned on his heel and started to run. The gunmen started firing. The first gunman was shooting at Bill. The second gunman was shooting, I think in my direction, Gail. Our little daughter ran screaming into the house, fortunately, and when the shooting stopped, I looked over to where Bill was lying, just a few feet in front of the car. He was almost certainly dead. There were several bullet holes in his head and blood was flowing from those. So it was a messy situation. I didn't feel the need to run to him. Um, there was nothing I could have done. Death in our conflict was indiscriminate. All kinds of people were killed. Beryl's husband was targeted as a member of the prison service. Others were simply caught in the crossfire. This is the Shankill Road, one of the most well-known loyalist areas in Belfast, and I'm here to meet Alan McBride. Alan's wife Sharon was merely working in her father Desmond Frizzell's fish shop one day when she and her father were killed in the Shankill Road bombing. Tell us about the uh, memorial. So yes, this was uh, brought together for the people that died in the Shankill bomb. Right, right. Uh, to the nine innocent victims, there was actually ten people died in the bomb. One yeah. of the guys that uh, carried the bomb in the shop died as well, but wow, wow. of course he's not remembered. Uh, on this memorial, yeah, yeah, just across the street, and uh, yep, just up up a bit. Uh, that's where the Frizzell's fish shop was. Uh, you know, it's obviously not there anymore. The only thing really that would tell you that it was there was a little plaque on the wall right, to say right. that, it, that that's where it was. But it was there for years. Right, um, your wife's father was the guy. Uh, he he owned it, and uh, she, she worked there once a month. Uh, a lot of people went there on a Saturday. It was like a sort of a tradition. Yeah, you know, you'd have gone yeah. to Frizzell's, got your fish, and then wow. maybe off to the pub or something. You know, we were married for about seven years. Uh, we had a baby, Zoe. You know, we were young, we had our lives in front of us. Um, on the 23rd of October, 1993, it was a, a beautiful day. And Sharon asked me if I would drop her off to her father's fish shop business, which of course uh, I said I would. I came back into the house at about two o'clock in the afternoon and a friend called around to say that he'd heard in the news that there was a, a bomb on the Shankle in Belfast. And I think, you know, growing up through the troubles and you know, the abnormal becoming normal. Uh, I never thought for a minute that this was anything serious. I never thought for a minute that it would be anybody belonging to me. Uh, you wake up every day to the sounds of bombs and shootings and killings. But he was quite determined that we go down and see what was going on. So I actually went down with him. Uh, and when we walked to the corner, uh, the shop was just blown to bits. It was just ruins and people looking for body parts and sound of ambulances and police sirens and fire brigade, and, uh, a lot of noise, a lot of people screaming and shouting and crying. Uh, I was taken to a wee bookshop that was just right beside the, the, the fish shop where it was. From there we were taken over to the Mater Hospital and uh, it was there that we were finally told about our, our loved ones. Uh, our family was the last to be told and the doctor came out and he just had a, a ring on him 
uh, and uh, he said to me, did I recognise it? And of course I did. Uh, it was Sharon's engagement ring. And he said to me, well, look, this was taken from the body of a young woman that was found dead at the scene. This is Shankill, yeah, you can see from the flags that it's a very uh, loyalist part of town. Yeah. Um, we're going to be passing here, next corner actually, the Rax Bar, which is pretty much the UVF headquarters on the Shankill right, Road. Right, right, right. Uh, so a bar that you really wouldn't, um, uh, certainly if you weren't from this road or were a Catholic, you wouldn't want to be having a drink in. Wow. Definitely very much the, the heart of, uh, of loyalism, unionism uh, in, in Belfast. Yeah. You know? You would have grown up in, not in this area, but in a similar area. What was it like growing up with that psyche of, uh, you know, a loyalist yeah. mindset? And well, I was born in 1964 and the Troubles kicked off in 1969. So essentially, my whole life was just the Troubles. Mm. Uh, I never really knew any Catholics, apart from uh, my, my sister married a Catholic and he was the only Catholic I knew back then. Uh, Catholics to me were people that you threw stones at and shouted abuse at or, you know, you didn't really uh, get to know them that well. Yeah. I mean, the two guys that murdered my wife were 19 years old and, I mean, they were brought up in Ardoin, which is not that far away from where I grew up. And uh, when they were 19, they walked into that fish shop, left a bomb on the counter and murdered people that they'd never ever seen in their lives before. And you have to ask yourself the question, I mean, what, you know, what has to happen to a person to make them, you know, want to do that in the first place and then to have the courage to actually carry it out, yeah. you know? and. I know sometimes you can dismiss them as just cold-blooded psychopathic killers and I mean that's quite easy to do and quite convenient that kind of means you don't have to deal with the reality that actually there are human beings and they were you know probably not that much different from you or me. When we're born we don't know whether we're black or white or what colour we are, we don't know what nationality we are, we don't know what religious grouping we belong to because we haven't learned that and in time we learn that as we grow up from our parents and from society. And I sometimes think that really what we have to do is leave some of our tribalism behind and walk into a new place of peace. The Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Somehow, in spite of the killings of their loved ones, Eugene, Allen, and Beryl show an amazing capacity to recognize the humanity of those who murdered them. By doing so, they help to break the endless cycle of violence and retribution. The events of your husband's death were you know, many years ago. How did you, I mean, from what I remember, you were able to communicate kind of forgiveness somehow. People often, when something has been done to them, mm -hmm. want justice. Yeah. And I honestly don't believe we're going to get justice in yeah. this life. Yeah. And um, as far as my situation was mm -hmm. concerned, when my husband Bill was killed, mm -hmm. there were two gunmen involved. Only one gunman went to prison. Mm -hmm. And so there was a sense in which mm -hmm. the guy who actually emptied his gun into Bill's mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. didn't ever go to uh, mm -hmm. court. There was oh. insufficient evidence. Yeah. So if I'd been looking for justice, yes, yeah. I wouldn't yeah. have got it. Yeah. Um, and so when the, what I call the second gunman, who was probably shooting in my mm -hmm. direction, when he got out of prison, I thought, well, I don't have a problem with this because mm -hmm. this is something that... Uh, none of us have asked for. Mm. Um, it's part of the political, mm. hopefully, solution mm. to getting a better life. Mm. And I thought, well, do you know, I've had the joy and the privilege of bringing up my little daughter mm. all these years. He's been in prison mm. and he hasn't had his wife and family mm. to care for. Mm. And my thoughts that morning were, I mm. hope he can go home, yeah. catch yeah up with where all the things he's lost out on, mm -hmm. build relationships with his children mm -hmm. and his wife and live mm -hmm. a more peaceful, more fulfilled mm -hmm. life. Yeah, Those yeah. were my sentiments that morning, wow. that he'd almost imprisoned himself. Yeah, um, yeah. It was nothing that I had ever asked for yeah. or expected. It was part of the legal process. Yeah. And Gail was just a, a wee girl? She was time. three and a half, wow. yes. Um, and it's interesting, you know, as a three and a half year old, mm -hmm. when I was putting her to bed each mm -hmm. evening, I would have read her stories wow. and then we would have prayed. 
and um, it was either that night or the next night that Gail interrupted my prayers and said, God, did you know there were two bad men came mm. with guns to kill my daddy? Would you make them into good men? And I thought, you know, out of the, 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 the voice of a small child who knew that God can change people's hearts. Most people who study conflict, they say conflict is passed down from parents, kids, and from grandparents. And, and the problem in, in situations where there's been genocide or war is the, the memory may skip a generation, but it'll resurface. But to be someone who's raising your child in a way to deliberately remember what was done in a different way, instead of remembering it as these these bad, evil people that we're angry at, and, you know, remembering that, they're, that they themselves, the, the, the killers themselves, are almost victims. Yeah, for the morning of the funeral here, I think there was about 10,000 people out. Is that right? And again, it was, God. you just couldn't get into this grave. Wow. Yeah. This is our graveyard here, John. Yeah, so there's the there's the three boys there. You know? yeah. Lovely fellas, you know. Yeah, yeah. And is your mum mummy here? Yeah, that's where they're sitting. Yeah, right. The eighth of July, thirteenth. So she's yeah. five years. I was telling you yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. In, in July. Yeah. On the father died, James, when he was fifty-eight. Wow. Um, he died five years after the shooting. Yeah. On fourteen heart attacks later. Wow. On the night that my that my brothers were shot, my father prayed for them when we were in we, when we were in the house, and he says they need the, their prayers more mm. than wow. the than our boys wow. because someday they're going to have to answer to mm. their to their maker. Mm. And my mother, uh, she used to light a candle mm. for them every morning. She'd have a whole row of candles along. Mm. There was all a candle here, and that was for the that was for the people that mm. murdered our sons. And like, mm. she really, she never blamed them. She used to say, "Well, I, I, you know, I don't blame those fellas that were like the like they actually did the the shooting, but there was all the people behind them or people that mm. sent them out. Mm. But my father t uh, took us all and mm. just after the shooting, uh, uh, Annie." He asked for that, like that there would be no mm. retaliation mm. for the death of his sons. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, he was a, he was a very Christian man well, too, you know. Amazing, amazing. Yes, and and it was great that a, a big house full of boys left, and none yeah. of them ever joined up with uh, yeah. uh, yeah. the yeah. So um, I was very proud yeah. of, of that, you know. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a very difficult line, and it's a very fine Aye. line. On the news the next day, Eugene's father pleaded for no retaliation and he swore his sons to promise that they would never join the IRA or seek revenge. Within minutes of this plea, the Kings Mill massacre was committed just a few minutes up the road from the Reavy House in White Cross. It was an awful atrocity where 10 Protestant workmen were shot in cold blood. The night before the Reavy brothers were killed, they had been playing pool with two brothers, Walter and Reginald Chapman. Within two days, they would all be dead. What makes Eugene's story more tragic is that he was then wrongly implicated in the Kings Mill Massacre and faced intimidation from the very security forces whose job should have been to keep him safe. I left for a walk and the soldiers stopped me at the river, at the bridge. And they took me out of the car and they put me into the river. And the water was up to my nose, just there. And this man came in and he took out this gun and he, and he put it to my head and he says, who shot the people at Kings Mills? And I says, I don't know. <coughs> who shot the people at Kings Mills? <coughs> and this went on for five times. They all walked away and left me sitting, you know, kneeling in the river. Wednesday morning, I came down the road, stopped again into the, uh, 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 back into the river. The next morning I went down, same thing, out of the car, into the river, and 
And on the Friday morning, I went back down again and he put me into the river again. And that was the end of that. There was no, there was no more. There was nothing ever said. So, 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 so I, I rang Bestbrook Barracks to the police and I, and I told them what happened. And they laughed at me. They just laughed. And, and they said to me, well, that'll, uh, um, you know, that'll teach you not to be, not to be shooting your neighbours. How long have you been in this house then? Is it? Oh God, 20 years more. Seamus. Eugene Reavy. I'm, I'm fine. Seamus, I have a, <coughs> I have a gang of, uh, carpet baggers here. <laughs> Seamus, they're, they're, they're making a, a, a documentary. Would you be, would you be available after a while to, for they say a few words to them? It's about the Reavy brothers here. You would? Well, if they want to come now. If they want to come now. That, that's all right. All right. Yeah, to be. Right. Right, James, okay. We'll be there in 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, don't leave it any later. Thanks, Seamus. Thank you. Right, right. Well, okay, that'll be good. Right. Let's go. Seamus Mallon was the Deputy First Minister of the new Northern Irish Assembly, which was agreed on as a result of the Good Friday Agreement. Seamus shook hands at three in the morning with the Ulster Unionists, bringing to an end 29 years of conflict. What's your memory of, I mean, of those times, you know, of the, the Reavy killings and... The Reavy killings reeked of savagery mm. and the sectarian hatred mm. that uh, is hard to define. Mm. The remarkable thing about that uh, afterwards was the absolute Christian way in which his family, mm. and Eugene himself, of course, mm. dealt with it. Yeah. No retaliations, no, no bitterness. Mm. Because when you have neighbours killing neighbours, it poisons the entire society. Mm. People become suspicious, mm. they become angry, they go into their own tribe mm. Mm. For, mm. for comfort and protection and the type of good neighbourliness uh, is affected greatly. And you look at other places of conflict, like what do you think is some of the ingredients of real transformation in a society and reconciliation and dealing with events that have happened 10 years ago or 100 years ago? 400 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> this wall, that was the perimeter wall of the first place that it was planted wow. in 1610. Each community can call this place home mm. and regard it as their home. Mm. And more importantly, have it regarded as their home mm. by the other community. Mm. And a home means peace and it means stability and that means protection, all of the things that we associate with home. There's a good starting point. And in a divided society here, where you have a clash of identities, mm. part of the population regard themselves as British. Mm. I, Eugene, others mm. regard ourselves as Irish. But to be honest, people have a right to call themselves whatever they want. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we respect that. Yeah. You know, I think with the Reavy killers um, and with the Kings Mill massacre, you know, there's a need for truth, but truth that will lead to reconciliation. And, uh, and I think Eugene's a great example of someone who, um, who really is, is trying to live that out.
truth without a desire for reconciliation become can be, almost in itself become a retributive act. You know, we want the truth to kind of punish other people. But when you want the truth so that you can actually advance reconciliation, then you're actually in quite a, a deep place. You're in a place where real transformation can happen in a country. I, mean, I suppose the, the, the big breakthrough moment came for me in, uh, in Edinburgh, of all places. There were two ex-prisoners there, one a Republican and one a Loyalist, and then there were a couple of other people as well. But I ended up sitting beside this Loyalist ex-prisoner on the way out, and we struck up a conversation, and we touched down in Edinburgh. He said to me, you know, look, I've enjoyed talking to you. Do you want to go into Edinburgh and we'll, we'll, we'll have a beer and continue the conversation? But there was another guy on the plane that day who was from the IRA, a Republican, uh, part of the organisation that murdered my wife. And uh, I knew right away that if we were going to go out and have this drink, that it couldn't just be me and this loyalist guy, that we would have to invite the Republican to come with us, because if we didn't, it would almost be like I was taking sides, and I was saying, well, it's okay, you're one of us, so you can, you can carry out these kind of atrocities, but you can't because you're not, you know, that, that sort of thinking. Uh, as we were talking about this, the guy came over and introduced himself, and all three of us went into Edinburgh that evening, and I can remember sharing the story, and the uh, Republican guy, at the end of it, just looked me in the face, and actually took my hand and he said to me, you know, Alan, what happened that Dennis Shankarlow was wrong? And I, as an Irish Republican, I'm sorry. I've come to the North Coast to visit the Corrymeela community. Corrymeela was set up prior to the Troubles by Ray Davey. He had witnessed firsthand the horrors of the Second World War and wanted to create a space that would cultivate reconciliation. As the Troubles tore through Northern Irish society in the late 60s and 70s, Corrymeela became a place where people from the other side could encounter each other. So, you know, I think one of the realities is that the cross is, um, can be used as a, a demographic symbol that demarcates different tribes. And uh, when it's used like that, it's a, it's a defensive thing, it's a... It's, a, it's something that's really counter to the spirit of what it's meant to be about. For, for Christians, uh, we use, there's a verse in Ephesians 2 that says, on the cross, Jesus was uh, uh, destroying the dividing wall that kept two groups of people apart. And so the cross really should be a symbol of embrace of the other, an embrace of the enemy, um, not a symbol that divides and creates boundary markers. Corrymeela was a space where Christianity was seen as centering on the message of reconciliation and understanding that the Bible is not about individualistic escapism, but about embracing our enemies and even those who have most hurt us. I'm here to meet with the community leader and my old friend, Padrigo Tuma. I saw you once wrote a wee thing about the name, yeah. and what, what, what was your kind of reflection on the name? And well, it's more a historical reflection. In 1965, somebody said on the first day that they were up, somebody said, what should we call it? And Ray said, what's this townland? And somebody said, oh, Corrymeela. And he went to the Corrymeela community. It was a totally arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. And some naive, well-meaning idiot came and said, oh, Corrymeela means Hill of Harmony. They were all delighted. <laughs> it was just thrilling. And a few years later, the troubles broke out. And uh, I mean, the early 70s were horrific in terms mm. of death and grief and tension mm. and escalating violence and political standoffing. So um, in about 1975, uh, an actual etymologist of old Irish came through and said, it definitely doesn't mean hella harmony. If it means anything, it probably means something like um, lumpy crossing place. Mm. And they were like, we'll take that. That's much better because that's where peace is. Peace is compromise, peace is difficult. Peace is having conversations that you never wanted to have or thought you'd have. Peace is learning to understand things that you find abhorrent. Peace is sitting in a room with somebody who you have considered your enemy and trying to figure out how do I live in relationship with somebody whose actions have impacted my life for the negative. And that, that never feels easy and that certainly doesn't have the cadence of harmony. It's a lumpy crossing place and so we really are named by the land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose what, what is um, in a way unique about Karimila is that you know, you're founded from this very strong Christian ethos, uh, I kind of go into some of the, what do you think of the, the theology of reconciliation? Where do we see reconciliation in the Bible? Like what's that got to do yeah. with religion? You know? Yeah. I mean, 
Ray Davey, the founder of Coromela, said that if Christians can't speak about reconciliation, they can't speak about anything. And so he considered that reconciliation was really fundamental to the witness of Christianity on this island. How is it that we scapegoat groups of people and refuse to have relationships and demonize them, sometimes literally in the context of this or other than? And for us, the motivation of the gospel isn't really to think about who's going to get into heaven or not. I mean, that's not really our interest. The question is, is how do we relate to each other now? Mm, the fact that religion can be toxic and it can be redemptive and healing. Um, you know, you know, and what's your reflection on, on that reality in, in this place? Yeah, yeah. sure. Christianity certainly needs to find ways in, in Ireland to bear witness to the fact that we have been used for good and for terror, for harm and for healing. The broad wounds and harm that have been done in the name of Christianity or in the name of some kind of witness um, through colonialism, through resistance, people have done all kinds of things that go against the faith that they are claiming. And I think uh, it's one of the words that I think uh, in old Christianity, repentance, that needs to be given public potency because uh, repentance, to change your mind from the Greek metanoia, is a really important word. What does it mean to change your mind and to be public in change? Often the witness of Christianity as it's known is a, a group that diagnoses the need for other people to change their mind. Right, yeah. And I think Christianity in Ireland can do really well by having a public witness bearing to the changing of minds internally and let that be the witness and see what happens then. Back in the day, I was very much a fundamentalist believer. Uh, I got involved with an organization called the 174 Trust and I started to meet uh, young Republicans down there uh, at that club. I was there to convert them, you know, to be Christians or more than that, to be Protestant Christians. Um, but I think it was them that ended up converting me uh, where I was able to see from their perspective you know, how, how Catholics in general were discriminated against by essentially, you know, a, a Protestant Unionist state. I had many, many friends, kids, young people that came into that club uh, that I knew and got to know very, very well. And I got to have real sympathy and real empathy for their, their situation. And I saw things happen that as a young Protestant growing up in the West End, I would never have believed could happen. Uh, in terms of how they were treated, for example, by the British Army. In rebuilding divided societies, it seems we need third spaces that show us what peace could look like. Corrymeela is like that, and in the valley above Rostrevor is another such otherworldly place where monks in white robes devote their life to prayer and welcoming all that come to their door as if the stranger was Jesus himself. The Benedictine monks at Ross Trevor are deeply committed to seeing walls of division come down. For that reason, it's hardly surprising that their visitors are almost equally drawn from both sides of Northern Ireland's religious divide. Father Mark is the prior of the Holy Cross Monastery. Outside uh, the church here, outside in the monastery, is uh, this one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Is it uh, your calling? Or? There was an Anglican theologian who once put it this way. And I had an Anglican teacher who used to reinforce this a lot. Your God is too small. And I think sometimes as Christians living in our churches, our church can be too small, too restricted. And it has always been essential for me to be aware of the wider body of Christ. Yes, I'm situated as a Roman Catholic. I'm a monk in a Roman Catholic monastery. But I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, which is all those who confess one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And that's very important, I think, as our, our way of connection with all the people who come here. And they come from a wide variety of ecclesial backgrounds. Mm. That's summed up in the foundation decree of our monastery, where it is said that uh, we seek to contribute to reconciliation between Catholics and Protestants in a land stained by the blood of Christian brothers and sisters. Well, how does Christianity, you know, the religion of Jesus, the one who dies for us, he sacrifices life for his enemies, how did we get into tribal divisions and us and them and ultimately somehow conflict? You know, how, how do you kind of see that connection? What, where do we go wrong in it? And what do we need to, how do we change that? We've all suffered in Northern Ireland mm. from all sides mm. and over hundreds of years. Mm. And the suffering of one has been succeeded by the suffering of others. 
We had a brother who died in our monastery in the Holy Land, uh, Frère Alain. He died in the 1990s. And Frère Alain, on his deathbed, a Jewish doctor said to him, I can't understand you're dying of cancer so young. How do you? You're not angry. How do you? And Frère Alain wrote, and it's with his handwriting, I can see it written, suffering gives us no rights. Mm. And I think part of our big problem here is that we think that our suffering gives us rights and the right to make suffer those who have made us suffer. Mm. Whereas our suffering, if we follow Christ, can do something else. And what does his suffering do? It disarms and it brings healing and reconciliation. Now, I'm not talking about uh, setting aside justice mm. because there has to be justice if we're going to have peace. Mm. Peace depends upon justice. Mm. So there has to be that real earnest quest for justice. One of the words that can be difficult for people uh, is, the, is the word forgiveness. Um, how do you kind of see forgiveness and uh, how would you explain it to someone, you know? In a... you know so quite often we can have a very facile discourse around forgiveness mm -hmm. and that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And we forget that, I think it's very important for us to remember that forgiveness is something in front of us, something towards which we journey. And so often people are put in a terrible dilemma because you should forgive. So they think I should have forgiven and yet I'm struggling with the pain that I'm feeling. And to be engaged in the process, wanting to come to the point where you can move beyond where you're stuck, is it ready to be engaged in the process of forgiving? I said, Lord, what is it you're asking of me? And he reminded me of the Lord's Prayer. That portion that talks about forgiving others. And I said, Lord, are you going to judge me in the same manner as I am going to be judging these people? And I felt the Lord saying, yes, what are you going to do? And I said, Lord, I'm going to choose to forgive because I want to stand before you faultless in as much as I can. Um, but I can't do this on my own. You're going to have to help me every day for the rest of my life. Now, I got a sense of peace at that time. I haven't held any bitterness. And I can honestly say until this day, many, many years later, God has been faithful. He has uh, allowed me to walk in a place of grace and forgiveness. Forgiveness in relation to the people who carried the shankle bomb is not a real concept for me. Um, I, I have let go of that. I've, I find a way of moving on and perhaps I'm going to contradict myself here. Uh, because I have never really forgiven the people that murdered my wife. They've never, to my knowledge, sought my forgiveness. They have never really repented from, for what they did. And so my forgiveness is something that I have never really extended to them. But that said, I have been able to let go of it. I've been able to let go of the hurt and the pain. And, but my mother-in-law, whom I love dearly, you know, uh, if I was ever to f say I forgive them, she would never forgive me. And I, I just... There's just no way I would sacrifice that relationship. I don't wish them any, any ill will. You know, I mean, in the end of the day, you know, Thomas Begley and Sean Kelly were their names. Thomas Begley was killed, Sean Kelly survived and spent a very short period of time in jail. And I genuinely wish the guy well. I mean, I hope he gets on with his life and can, you know, can make a go of it. Forgiveness for me is something that I need to keep doing in all kinds of ways, not just with the gunmen who killed my husband, Bill. Um, it's holding on to things lightly and um, trusting that I can live a life that is meaningful and peaceful and enriching not only for me and my family, but for others. Um, it's not holding grudges. It's not taking up a gun. It's not being argumentative. It's trying to live a life of peace and tolerance. It's trying to listen and understand somebody else's point of view. And I may not always be able to understand it, but I have to appreciate that we're brought up in a particular culture or mindset, and that can affect our thinking. I'm in Belfast to visit Fitzroy Presbyterian Church, which was one of the most active congregations for reconciliation during the Troubles. Reverend Steve Stockman is the current minister of Fitzroy and is continuing their legacy of being a church that will follow the Jesus way of forming lasting deep relationships 
with those who we perceive as our enemies. To me, as soon as you say you're going to follow Jesus, the first things I came across were love your neighbor and then love your enemy. And being brought up in Northern Ireland, that's a no-brainer. You don't have to go too far to find where your enemy is or where the divisions are. And so to me, um, I don't need resilience to carry on what I'm doing. I just need to realize that for a long time, I wasn't following Jesus the way I knew I needed to. Mm. When the calling is, once you follow Jesus, if you're not involved in this, mm. I don't know what that means mm. um, because it's part of the deal. Yeah. And sadly in Northern Ireland, particularly maybe, maybe not particularly, um, for some reason that reconciliation ministry, that peacemaking ministry mm. um, has been lost. And mm. a friend of mine always said, Johnny, that uh, we're very good at our theology. We just don't read the Gospels enough. Yeah. Uh, we just don't read the Bible enough uh, yeah. because the Bible from cover to cover is about shalom. It's about, yeah. um, it's about some sense of wholeness in a society. The kingdom that we pray comes in God's will on earth is, is in heaven. Mm. Uh, as I imagine heaven, I don't imagine a divided community. Mm. So therefore, I should be about bringing that undivided community here. So it's part of the DNA of mm. the Christian. It's part of the scriptures. It's mm. a, a big part of it. Mm. Uh, he was the Prince of Peace. Mm. When they came, you know, that first morning when Jesus was born, uh, peace on earth to all, you know, you know it's, yeah. it's the core word in the whole deal. So the call is simple. If you're, if you're serious about following Jesus, then you got to work out how do you follow him into peacemaking. Yeah. We're not going to find peace trickling down from the hill in Stormont. We're going to find peace flowing up the hill to Stormont. And it has to happen on the ground. And I think there's a lot of stuff happening on the ground that hopefully will eventually make its way into uh, voting, into what people want to see, and what people will have to do on the hill for the good of the entire country. So the, um, this is uh, Clonard Monastery here, which was, some people call it the cradle of the peace talks. It's where really our peace process really started in one of these little rooms here. Uh, there were two priests who were very involved in the peace process that were based here. And uh, so it's a significant place. I'm going to meet Ed Peterson, who's the reconciliation worker here. Um, and he's an amazing guy. He used to work with Father Jerry Reynolds, who was, well, him and Father Alec Reed were really involved in the, in the process here. This Clonard, like, what was the significance? What was it? like some of the historical stuff? I know in the Second World War, there was sure. Belfast was bombed. Yeah, well, during the the Blitz in 1941 here in Belfast, uh, this area at the time was mixed Protestants and Catholics living mm -hmm. together, and during those uh, air raids that took place at that time, uh, mainly women and children took shelter actually right underneath this altar. Underneath here, below here, here wow. there is a crypt. And that was uh, a place where women and children wow. from the area during the air raids took shelter. But John, I just wanted to um, show you uh, the room, parlor four, that's in the monastery. And so this is a room where uh, it would have been John Hume and Jerry Adams, the two very significant political leaders, would have first come. And at the time, they weren't meant to talk to each other. It was, you know, they weren't meant to be really conversing. But, uh, but they did, and Father Alec Reed kind of let them come here and open up the doors for them to come. Yes, yeah, it was at a time where, like you say, they weren't really meant to be seen, uh, even within oh. their own communities, wow. uh, to be meeting one another. So they talk about uh, Jerry Adams would come through one door, say so the front door of the monastery, oh. and John Hume would have to come through the back door. Father Alec realized that something really had to be done he always said that he worked in the interest of that next person, maybe who was going to be killed, mm. and he wanted to prevent, you know, prevent the next person killing, yeah. from being killed. And so he was able to convince Jerry Adams and John Hume to to come and, in a way, be be vulnerable to to gather because nobody really knew exactly where that was going to lead. I remember whenever we would come here, Father Jerry would always 
get us to say the prayer of uh, uh, Paul Couturier, you know, the, yes, I, has, uh, you've got I, it there. I actually have it. Yeah, I, yeah, pretty yeah. much yeah, everyone yeah, who would have come it. in, he would have always had copies of this prayer. And the prayer goes as follows. Lord Jesus, who on the eve of your death prayed that all your disciples might be one, as you and the Father and the Father in you, make us feel intense sorrow over the infidelity of our disunity. Give us the honesty to recognize and the courage to reject whatever indifference towards one another or mutual distrust or even enmity lie hidden within us. Enable us to meet one another in you and let your prayer for the unity of Christians be ever in our hearts and on our lips. Unity such as you desire and by the means that you will. Make us find the way that leads to unity in you who are perfect charity through being obedient to the spirit of love and truth. Amen. You know, a, a religion or a faith perspective that says, I am absolutely right and you're absolutely wrong and because I'm absolutely right, you know, I have the, the right uh, to wipe you out, or I have the right, you know, not to listen to you, or I have the right uh, to treat you differently. Um, I think that, that, that is wrong. I mean, I suppose these days I'm, I'm very involved in peace and reconciliation work. Uh, I've got involved with various initiatives over the years. Uh, this latest one, the Truth and Reconciliation Platform, with, with Eugene and Stephen, and we've been going around the country um, telling their stories and really just opening it up to anybody that would listen. The message that we have doesn't change if we were, if we were going to a, to a Protestant hall or a Catholic hall or wherever. We don't change our message because the message is too strong and it can, and it can overcome whatever barriers that we see. For the last eight years, my wife and I have led a community that no longer straddles a peace wall, but sits directly on the Irish border. Our community is at Onkuin in Ross Trevor and has been a centre of reconciliation for decades, long before we arrived. Irish folk singer Tommy Sands is a very good friend and is one of Ireland's most beloved musicians. Under Queen Elizabeth I, the playing of the harp was illegal and many harpists were killed because they were often the leaders in their community. Tommy Sands is one of these modern day bards providing leadership through his music. Tonight, Tommy is holding one of his music of healing nights in Onkuin. It's been said that our identities are what make us different, but our stories are what make us the same. And I think what is beautiful about this night is it's a night where you get to hear people's stories and find commonality, even if people look different or are part of a different club. And, uh, and so you're all very welcome to this night. And I think Tommy Sands over the years has been a really significant voice uh, on this island of um, challenging us to move towards peace and reconciliation. We interviewed Seamus Mallon uh, for this documentary and obviously he was there shaking hands at two or three in the morning to sign the Good Friday Agreement, which really has been the peace agreement that's brought a level of peace to this land. Um, but in the days before that, you brought uh, Protestant and Catholic school children to sing outside the building where they were negotiating, which had a profound impact, I think, on many of the politicians. What was, what was that story? It was, I, I was watching TV, and uh, once the talks began in Stormont, uh, the news cameras were interviewing everyone, all the, the people taking part in the talks. But whenever the talks were on, they had to find new, new news. You hear an ambulance or something going like that. They're following ambulances, looking for trouble mm. somewhere. Mm. And they were interviewing everyone who disagreed with the talks. Mm. And uh, because television normally can't deal with peace very well. If you put a cam C in a blue sky on the screen and hold that shot for more than five seconds, mm. people will be Turn looking the for remote yeah. control, getting remote control, looking for storms. So we decided to create a storm for the six o'clock news. And we knew we might get eight seconds. So I had to say everything in a simple chorus, which was carry on because the talks were uh, faltering. And uh, the chorus went, carry on, carry on, you can hear.
Catholic and Protestant children were there singing the song, and when the politicians inside heard us, they stopped talking and came out and sang with us, because mm. I think they were so happy to hear people supporting mm. what they were doing. Seamus Mallon famously said it was the sound of children singing outside the negotiating room that helped to spur the politicians on to find an agreement in 1998. They realized it was for a new generation that they were making peace. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about a, a project you've been involved in in the last year where you've been bringing uh, Muslim, Christian and Jewish leaders together from around Ireland here at Onkuin and how did that come about? And The very essence of people's viewpoints mm. are different. Mm. Mm. So if we could find a higher quality of disagreement, mm. Mm. which would allow for further understanding and further questioning mm. and uh, functioning neighbourliness, mm. that would be a great achievement. Mm. We met knowing that there would be disagreement at the beginning, knowing there would be disagreement at the end, because that's the mindset and essence and faiths and so on. Mm. But if we could find a higher quality of disagreement, mm. which would change mm. everything. Mm. And uh, in a way, it doesn't matter if we disagree. Mm. And where do we disagree? Very often, uh, politics is informed mm. by religion. And religion is used mm. to divide mm. people. Usually religion's got nothing mm. to do with it. It's usually mm. oil, mm. money, mm. all mm. these things. It's got nothing to do with religion. Mm. But if you can get people to think it's religion mm. or mm. color or something, mm. then you, yeah. you've got your conflict going. Yeah, yeah. I guess, it, well, one of the songs that you wrote in the 70s was a, a song about a true story, uh, There Were Roses. Can you tell me a little bit about that, that song? And well, the people who came to our house they came from both sides and I remember one night in the summer when the roses were out along the hedges and we could hear explosions going off in the town of Newry five miles away and we could hear the Lambeg drums being played very loudly just a few fields away. Someone said no matter how close the troubles get to us here it won't change us because we work together in the fields, we know each other. But one year from that day many things had changed because one was actually shot in retaliation for the other being shot, even though they were friends. And for me, that summed up war anywhere, where ordinary people can be persuaded to fight each other just because they're different religions or different colors or different nations, and persuaded that they're not belonging to the same human race. So it was kind of, it was a, um, a, a Protestant was shot on the first, and then a Catholic was shot in retaliation? Yes but it, coincidentally, both the people killed were friends and knew each other. And I think that kind of sums up the futility of much of the violence and the sadness of it, you know, the yeah. tragedy of it. At the start of every Music of Healing event, Tommy plays a simple song that has an amazing effect on people. It simply makes them feel welcome and included, regardless of their color of skin, religion, or tribe. Here's Tommy singing a couple of verses of that song here. Shake the hand of the man from the far distant land Meet him and treat him well And the young girl so fair with the wind in her hair She's got a story to tell So let the circle be wide round the fireside And we'll soon make room for you Let your heart have no fear There are no strangers here Just friends that you never knew. We will travel along on the wings of a song with a mind that is open and free. If we close our eyes to the other side, we're just half of what we could be. So let the circle be wide round the fireside, and we'll soon make room for you. Let your heart have no fear. There are no strangers here, just friends that you love. Since, I mean, since the Good Friday Agreement, we have had relative peace. Now, I mean, it's, it's not perfect peace, but it is peace. I would like to see the day when our politicians here would really embrace uh, what it means to be good neighbours, because that's what needs to happen here. And 
you know, if you were common at uh, politics from wanting to be a good neighbour, uh, then you'd want to please your neighbour. You'd want to do what you could for your neighbour to make your neighbour feel welcome, to make your neighbour feel that they have an equal uh, part to play in this society. And I'm wondering, why can we not live our everyday lives appreciating one another and valuing one another for who we are? Not what labels are put on us or what tribe we've come from. I can't change the tribe I've come from, but I can change the way I look upon others. And I think that would bring about a more peaceful environment, certainly in Northern Ireland, perhaps elsewhere. My tradition, and still to this day, it's the same. I always go to watch the bonfires on the 11th of July, which is a time in Northern Ireland when you know, we, we light these huge fires. Uh, it's a big Protestant thing. And then the next day we go to the field, you know, to see the marching bands. It's very, very big in Protestant culture. Um, but the bonfires themselves over the years have become quite sectarianized. There's a lot of bad things that happen at bonfires. Um, uh, but I still go uh, because I've always went. Um, and this particular year, uh, my daughter had a couple of friends across the street, little Roman Catholic girls. And their parents that I'd got to know came over to the house and asked me if I would like to come to a barbecue in their house on the 11th of July. And I knew that that was my night for going into bonfires, and they knew this too. Uh, but they said, look, we know you go into bonfires, Alan, but why don't you come over early? And then you could leave, because the bonfires aren't usually that day about 11 o'clock or so at night. So I did, went over to the barbecue. Um, and when I got there, uh, these Roman Catholic neighbours uh, in their back garden had built a small bonfire uh, for me, uh, because they knew that, that was important. And we sat around the fire, we told stories, we ate burgers and we drank beer. And I just thought to myself that this is the part of Northern Ireland that I would love to be a part of. I would like to see this rolled out right across society where, you know, all the things that are contentious are no longer contentious because society has moved on. And rather than, you know, saying let's have none of that, we've actually got the place where we can say let's have all of that and that, you know, that diversity. Is, is something that enriches society and something that is welcomed. And uh, that's pretty much the Northern Ireland that I want to be part of uh, today. It takes a special calibre of person to not only move beyond seeking revenge or to move beyond seeing oneself as a victim, but to become a passionate activist for peace and reconciliation. I set out to discover how religion can be used not just for violence, but to bring healing and reconciliation to a divided society. However, what I've encountered are lives that transcend religion and religious boxes. Some of these transcendent people wear the label of Christianity, others don't, but utterly embody the golden rule of doing unto others what you would have them do unto you. Perhaps these are the guardians of the flame, of not just some system of belief, but of our very humanity itself. So 
Oh, no. 